All right, if you would, uh, please stand with me. <clears throat> Open your copy of God's Word to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Sorry about my cough. I apologize for that ahead of time. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you, believe, unless you believed in vain... Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. God the Father, we thank You for the Gospel. We thank You for the death the burial, and the resurrection of your Son. Thank you, God, in your divine plan, your perfect plan, your holy plan. At just the right time, Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, in the fullness of time, you sent your Son. And you sent Him for the purpose to redeem your prized creation, mankind, humanity, back to yourself. Because Genesis 3 clearly teaches us that we fell short of you. Sin was entered into the world. We rebelled against you. And since that point in time, we have been rebelling against you. But thankfully, you have provided the way back to yourself. And that way is through you, through your Son, we must admit we need Him. We must admit and believe that He is the Son of God, that He is perfect, that He is holy, and that He has done exactly what the Word of God says that He did, which was to come into this world, live the perfect life, die a horrible death for our sins. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us He died, He was buried, but in accordance with the Scriptures, He came back to life. Jesus, we celebrate that. We celebrate that victory. And for those of us who are your children, we have victory in you. But Father, I am sure that there are those who are here today who do not have that victory. Our prayer is, is that today they will begin to experience that victory through you. We love you, Jesus, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Today we want to talk about share and care. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 will be one of our texts. 2 Timothy 2, 2 will be our other text. But first I want to introduce it by talking about things that go together. A PB&J sandwich. Camden loves those. A BLT sandwich. I don't know why anyone would love those, but I understand there are a few people who do. Batman and Robin. I'm going to date myself now. Starsky and Hutch. Anybody know anything about Starsky and Hutch? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, we got a few folks back there. Excellent. Thelma and Louise. Ooh. Bonnie and Clyde. How about Sanford and Son? Yeah, there we go. Coming to join you, Elizabeth. How about... Michael and Dwight. Ah, there you go. I knew we'd have a few millennials out there that would get that one. Jim and Pam, right? Aren't they the, aren't they the couple in that little office deal? How about this one? Troy beating big time schools on their home fields. <laughs> You know, you just can't separate those things, right? You cannot separate Troy going into somebody else's house and just beating them. I mean, two consecutive years. I know what's happened in the past, but man, two consecutive years. Big time schools. 
You can't separate them. You can't separate a PB&J sandwich. You can't separate a BLT sandwich. You can't separate any of those things. Well, today we're going to talk about something you can't separate either. You cannot separate evangelism from discipleship. We need them both. They are two great spiritual disciplines. They truly go hand in hand. They are much like, in, in two different illustrations I'll offer to you, they are two wings on the same plane or two oars in the same boat. I don't think any of us in this room is going to get on a plane that only has one wing. If you do, I'd like to talk to you afterwards. You, have, you need, need some help. Now, we might get into a boat that only has one oar. We might think we can get across the lake, but, you know, after a while, you're going to realize that you're not, it's not going to happen. But discipleship and evangelism, they truly are like two wings on a plane or two oars in a boat. You need both of those in order to traverse the airways and the waterways. Well, Jesus was clear throughout the New Testament. Then his disciples were clear throughout the New Testament that you needed evangelism and you needed discipleship. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 <clears throat> speaks more about the evangelism piece the gospel specifically. Then 2 Timothy 2.2 2 will speak more about discipleship. But I'm thankful that here at First Baptist Church, that First Baptist Church has become focused on both of these important disciplines, evangelism as well as discipleship. Every Wednesday night, we have folks who will stand up and talk about gospel conversations that they've had with their friends, family members, co-workers, or just folks at the gas station. They have opportunities to share the faith, and they take advantage of it. We also have folks who are equipping people for the purpose of replication, multiplication, and reproduction. Men and men, women and women. Different ages together. I'm thankful that here at First Baptist Troy, we have that going on. And my prayer is that those two things will continue because they are two great, important spiritual disciplines that truly go together. You cannot and we must not separate those. Evangelism with discipleship. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 specifically, Paul focuses here on the gospel. And so we want to talk about that as we must share. Notice at the beginning of verse 3 what Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Paul wanted to make sure that the church at Corinth knew that there was nothing more important to him or to them than to share the message of the good news, to share the message of the gospel. Paul wanted them to know that it was his top priority. We too, it must be our top priority. It is of utmost importance. It is the highest priority for us to make sure that we are sharing the gospel. And when we share the gospel, we must do exactly what Paul stated here in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. We must share the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had the privilege the last two Sunday mornings as we witnessed two young folks get baptized. We were witnessing them publicly identifying themselves with Christ, publicly stating that they are taking on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the beauties of baptism. So when we are sharing the gospel, we must make sure that we share about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, his victory over sin and spiritual death, and point people to one day the Bible tells us that he will be victorious over physical death. But we must share this truth. And as we're sharing this truth, we must share this as well. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus always will be holy. So it begins there, the holiness of Jesus, the holiness of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And in Genesis 1 and 2, things were great. Things were perfect. Adam and Eve had everything going for them. But Genesis 3 happens. Eve and Adam, they rebel against God. And as a result of that, now every one of us are born with a sinful nature. And so therefore, we are all sinners. Paul speaks about it in Romans chapter 3 pretty clearly. 
We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. So Jesus is holy, always has been holy, always will be holy. And we are sinners. And we had no way to heaven except through Jesus. Jesus bridging the gap. Jesus came to this earth. He put on flesh. John 1 tells us that. Jesus lived the perfect life. Hebrews 4.15 talks about that he is the great high priest. He can sympathize with us. He was in, tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet without sin. We're sinners. He is not. He lived the perfect life. He went to the cross. He took spikes in his wrist, had a crown of thorns jammed on his head. He was jammed into the ground on the hill of Calvary. He had a spear going to his side. Some commentators would argue that he was naked in front of all the world to see. And he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When all of the sin of humanity was placed on his shoulders. Yours, mine, the seven billion people inhabit this planet, all the ones before that, all the ones behind that, and are coming soon. He took all of that upon himself. Then he died, and yes, he did die. And then he was laid in the tomb, the Bible tells us, three days. You know what? Satan thought he'd won. Satan thought he'd won. His disciples thought that he was gone. But yet the Bible tells us on the third day he came back to life. And then over the next 40 days he would appear to his disciples and to his other followers, telling them about himself, telling them what he had done, and preparing them for what they now were to do. But Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. And the third day he came back to life. And as a result of that, and if we will repent of our sins, if we will repent and acknowledge that we are a sinner, and if we believe in him that he is the Son of God, and if we cry out to him in faith, we will be forgiven of our sins. It is the most unbelievable gift that could ever be given. We could never earn it. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Because we would boast about that if we could earn salvation. We boast about all, all kind of stuff, right? How smart we are, how much money we have, what kind of house we live in. Uh, you know, what ball team we uh, cheer for. All of us cheer for Troy, of course. We don't have to worry about all those other teams. You know, we boast about everything. But Jesus said, you cannot boast in this because you cannot earn it. It truly is a free gift. And if you believe that, if you receive that, then you will be saved. And then what you are to do, then you are to begin to share that beautiful message with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with people you just meet at the gas station. Well, preacher, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But if we claim to have the greatest gift ever to be given, don't we want to share that? If we truly love the people of Troy, Alabama and Pike County, Alabama, don't we want to make sure that they hear that Jesus died, was buried, and came back to life for their sins? Don't we want them to hear that? Yes, we do. I'll answer for you. Yes, we do. We do. Evangelism is important. But you know, it's not just enough to live the Christian life. It's not just enough to have a lifestyle of evangelism. By the way, we should live a moral life. We should live a faithful life. But I would argue there are other quote-unquote faiths who are more moral than us. And they don't know Jesus. So it's not enough for us to live what the Bible says. It's a start, and we should do it. But at some point, we will actually have to open our mouths and verbally share the gospel. We will have to use words because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing in hearing through the Word 
of Christ. Romans 10, 17. So if someone's going to hear it, that means someone had to speak it. It's not enough to live the perfect life. None of us really can. We're to attain that or or strive to attain that. It's not enough to live the good life. We should do that. But at some point, we must open our mouths and share the gospel. For Paul, that was, it is of utmost importance. It is my top priority that you know the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the scriptures. Paul wanted to make sure that they knew that we need to have that same urgency. And I want to encourage you at First Baptist Troy to continue to witness, to continue to have those gospel conversations with people you work with, with people that you go to the restaurant with, with people that you live in your home with. Seek to have a gospel conversation with them, pointing them to Jesus. Because you know what? Jesus wants them to know Him. Why? Because they are his prized creation. They're his prized creation. He created them. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 tells us that he knows everything about them. He knitted them together just like he did us. Jesus wants them to know him. And we have been placed in this town at this time in history to share the good news of the gospel. So we must share. So that's one wing of the plane, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The second, the other wing of the plane, or the other oar of the boat, if you will, we must care. So it begins by sharing, but then secondly, we must care. What what do you mean by care? Notice what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians, rather, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2. Chapter 2, verse 2, Paul tells Timothy, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So the second wing or second oar is discipleship. One is not more important than the other. Both are equally important. We need them both. It's not either or, it's both and. So after someone trusts in Jesus, we could argue that our work has really begun. And I think you'd have a strong argument there. So now after Mr. Eric Cordell was just baptized today, the work for his family has really just begun. The work for his Sunday school teachers, for his mission teachers, his children's teachers, all the people within this congregation, the work has just begun. Because he needs to hear the word, be equipped in the word, so that then he can begin to equip others in the word, and then they can equip others in the word. Because check, check it out here in verse 2 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is a four-generation thread that Paul weaves here. First it goes from Paul to Timothy. Then Timothy to faithful men. Then faithful men to others. So it begins with Paul, then it goes to Timothy, then from Timothy to faithful men, and then faithful men to others. I think my generations are correct here. That's basically a great grandchild. So that's what Paul is laying out for Timothy in the first century. That is also what the Holy Spirit is laying out for us In 2018, in the 21st century, we call that multiplication. We call that replication. We call that reproduction. You're equipping people to do what? To study the Bible. Help them to learn how to study the Bible. Because a new believer does not know how to study the Bible. You're going to help them to learn how to pray. In Luke chapter 11, what did the disciples ask Jesus to do? Jesus, please teach us how to pray. You're also going to teach people how to memorize Scripture. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 119, verse 11? God, I want to hide your word in my heart so that I will not, what? Sin against you. So, as we're replicating these truths, we want to make sure people learn how to study the Word, how to pray, how to memorize Scripture, also then how to live a holy life. Then we want to make sure they know how to share the gospel. Teach them If you want to, the Roman road of salvation, if that's your cup of tea, go with that one. If you want to do the three circles, go with that one. If you want to do the bridge illustration, go with that one. If you want to do faith evangelism, go with that one. If you want to do CWT, go with that one. If you want to do evangelism explosion, it doesn't matter. Just make sure 
as you are reproducing to make sure that they understand how they can share the gospel. And then challenge them throughout the entire process. Hey, I'm not doing this so that you can just hold all this information in. You know why I'm doing this? I'm doing this so that you can pass it on to someone else. I'm doing this so that we can replicate, so that we can reproduce, so that we can multiply. What a joy it is to hear of accounts of men and women meeting together in discipleship groups throughout the week with this church. All different ages meeting together. Doing many of those things I just said. Teaching one another how to study the Bible. Teaching how to pray. Teaching how to memorize scripture. And on and on and on. I've heard some accounts of a third generation occurring. Spiritual grandchildren. Soon there are going to be accounts of spiritual great grandchildren happening in this church. Praise Jesus for that. That is what he has called us to do. I want to encourage you to continue to have intentional discipleship groups. One-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three. Seize those. Seek those. Evangelism and discipleship, they are together. They are meant to be together. Because God is using discipleship groups to transform his body here at First Baptist Church. If you had the privilege last Sunday night to, uh, to listen to the men who were ordained as deacons, you heard quite a few of them talk about, and maybe they didn't necessarily say discipleship groups, but that's what they were alluding to. You're beginning to see that as you raise up and elect men to lead you. They have gone through this replication, and they are actually replicating themselves now. But God's desire is for further transformation to occur. Don't stop. Keep going. You must keep going. You cannot stop. Because it is a very command from God the Father Himself. Evangelism is share. We must share the gospel. It's very important. There are people all throughout Troy and Pike County who need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we have the message we must share with them. But then we must begin the work of discipleship once someone trusts in Jesus, the care part. And if we truly care about them, we are going to disciple them, equip them, mentor them, whatever term you want to use. They're all synonymous, I would argue. But it's a both and, it's not an either or. Evangelism is not more important than discipleship, and discipleship is not more important than evangelism. Remember now, you need two wings for a plane. I don't think any of us are going to get on a one-wing uh, plane. At least I'm not. Maybe some of you are crazy enough to do it, but may the Lord Jesus be with you as you go. We might be crazy enough to get into a boat with one oar, but you're going to be kind of spinning around in that lake for a while. Good luck with that. But we need both. We need evangelism and discipleship. So we're commanded by God through His Word to be involved in both. From the youngest in this room as a follower of Jesus to the most senior saint in this room and everyone in between, we are called and commanded by God the Father to be involved in both. I challenge you to pray that God would give you an opportunity this week to have a gospel conversation. And when God gives you that opportunity, I pray that you would seize it. Because I'm praying the same thing for me. And I want you to pray for me that I would seize those opportunities. Then I pray that God would convict all of us to do what Titus 2 talks about. Have those type of intergenerational relationships where we're focused on growing in our faith. Older men with younger men. Older ladies with younger ladies. That's what the Bible states. We are called to do both of them. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can't participate in either one of these yet. Because you don't know Christ. But today, you've heard about Jesus Christ and what He did. You heard about Him coming and living the perfect life on this planet you heard about him dying on the cross for your sins, my sins. You heard about him being buried. 
You heard about him coming back to life on the third day according to the scriptures. And as a result of that, he has defeated sin and spiritual death. And one day the Bible tells us he's coming to defeat physical death. Now, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you have the opportunity right now to trust in him as your Lord and Savior. But you must admit that you need him. You must admit that you're a sinner. You must confess that sin. You must repent of that sin, which means turning from that sin and turning to Jesus Christ in faith. And calling out in his name. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to forgive me of my sins. Because you're holy, I'm not. You're perfect, I'm not. But I know you desire to save me. And today, God, I ask you to save me. And if you believe that he is the son of God, and you believe that he can save you, and you cry out in his name in faith for salvation, you know what the Bible tells us he'll do? He will forgive you of your sins. And you will begin this journey of faith, just like Eric Cordell has begun. You can begin to walk with him on that journey. And then a brother or sister in this congregation should come up next to you and say, listen, I want to walk with you as you begin your journey in faith. Because you've just really started. Now the real work has begun. And I want to walk with you. I want to help you. I'm not perfect. I don't know it all. But we can go together. And the reason I'm going to do that with you is because I want you in about 16 months, 18 months, a year, two years, whatever it is, then I want you to find someone that you can tell all of the things that you're being taught. Because we want you to multiply. We want you to replicate. We want you to reproduce. We want you to begin to share the gospel and begin to care enough for those who have trusted in the gospel to begin to help them grow. So if that's you today, you've never trusted in Jesus, right now, Jesus is calling for you to be saved. But you have to make that decision. I can't make it for you. No one else can. You have to decide, do I really want him? Do I really need him? And the Bible tells us, yes, on both accounts. You definitely need him, and you definitely want him. But you have to decide. What are you going to do today? Will you trust in Jesus? And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, are we going to commit to Him that we're going to do evangelism? We must share. And we're going to do discipleship. We must care. We're going to share and care. Remember now, uh, those two things, they cannot be separated. They're both and, not either or. Thank God that He's begun to do that work here. And we know and we trust and we pray that that work will continue. Because it's of Him. Those are two spiritual disciplines that He has set aside for every believer to be involved in. And if you're not, I pray today that God is convicting you of that.